Well, hello, and welcome to another another show of the Universal Truth from the son of an SMB. As many of you know, I grew up the son of an SMB. My dad was a, a reseller for 50 years and still is, still trying to get by at 92 years old. And my dad probably should have listened to this, to this uh, episode we're doing now. How do you prepare your business for a sale before it's too late? A lot of times people are selling their business, but you just want to hold on because that's your lifeline. That's your 401k. And, but sometimes some of these people have made the right decisions. A very fortunate day to have a couple folks that have sold their businesses. I'd like to introduce them. In fact, let's do this. Pratik, why don't you introduce yourself first? And then, Tom, if you wouldn't mind, introduce yourself. You don't have to go into detail about your sale, but um, we'll go back to that in just a minute. But tell them a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, my name is Pratik Ruchadari. Um I bought my first MSB uh, about uh, almost nine years ago now uh, in Tampa, grew it, sold it to a private equity group, and then um, actually just bought my second one, a larger MSB um, out of uh, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Great. Tommy? Hi, Bob. Yeah, me too. I'm a son of an SMB uh, as well. My father was a convenience store owner. And, I knew uh, that. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I'm a former MSP business owner, um, built the company up over the 90s through the 2000s and eventually uh, grew it into a successful MSP and uh, sold it. And uh, over the past 10 years, really just been doing consulting and advising out to the industry, wrote a book called the MSP CEO, and uh, am now uh, starting up uh, a whole new IT services company from scratch. I didn't buy one, but I'm, I've got a different uh, model moving forward, but uh, I'm back in the IT service business as well. So glad to be here. Well, as we older guys like to say, we're getting the band back together again. That's exactly right. I want to tell you that one of the big questions is that I think a lot of our folks out there would be wondering is, how do you know when it's the good or right time to sell your your business? Pratik, yeah, what are your what are thoughts on that? Yeah, um, you know, to me, it's the maturity and the financial curve. I always believe every business has a curve that they go through. There is, there is, you know, figuring out what it is, and then there is this period of really strong hyper growth, um, higher than industry CAG or average growth, and then you kind of start to plateau. And there is a sweet spot there, and and really figuring out and timing that sweet spot is so important. Uh, the the second thing I would say is um, kind of thinking of your own career goals, you know, your own personal goals. And um, do you have the energy? MSP business in general is a very high energy game and uh, most technology businesses are. So really where you are with your energy and, you know, in, in this kind of a business, it's easy to, after five to 10 years, it's, um, it, it's time to go do something else. So really where you are in your, in your career curve uh, is important so I would say those two things, understanding those two things is where you are in the financial maturity curve of a business and your personal goals, those should um, kind of drive your decision to sell. Well, and Tommy, before you get started, I think a lot for a lot of people, it's a very personal thing as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I can speak for my own father. There's a long time ago, he probably should have sold his business and he didn't. And for most of our SMB friends, that business is their 401k. So if you don't sell at the right time, it really affects your 401k, Tommy. But tell me, how did you know, Tommy, when you decided? Well, you know, I, I agree with all the things Patrick said. You know, they're all very important. Um, I think the key thing that a lot of business owners should think about is, you know, what's the amount of money that you want in your personal bank account? You know, what's that dollar amount that's going to be enticing enough to, to let you walk away from your baby that you've worked on all these years and nurtured and, so there's a certain should be a certain financial goal, depending upon your own goal for financial independence and such like that. And so my partner and I, we both had, you know, this number out there. And in along the years, we had lots of offers, but they never really came up to the offer that, you know, we personally wanted in our personal banking accounts. And and it, and, it, and it wasn't until that offer came around and it's, you know, an all cash deal that we determined that, yes, that's the. That's the right deal. And, and also because of the other factors that Patrick mentioned, you know, you plateaued out, you know, there's a lot of things going on after, you know, 20 years of running an MSP business with uh, burnout amongst, you know, owners and key executives and stuff that are doing that. So, 
you know, taking the right time to take a break, you know, I think was, was also a, a good consideration as well. Tommy, I think we're all sitting there thinking the same thing while from watching on TV. When you say it was an all cash deal, I picture this guy walking in with a briefcase filled with cash, putting on the desk, and you <laughs> hand in the title of the business. Maybe I, maybe I'm just missing something. But I picture a guy coming in with a briefcase. No, but, but I know that. It, it, no, but it was fun to to take a, a a large check and take it down to your personal bank teller and put it into your bank account. I mean, it, it, that was that was a very satisfying. It's almost like taking a sack of cash, but instead this is a, a check, right? And so that was that was a nice little uh, sense of of, of uh, closing there. I guess saying <laughs> I got it across the finish line. <laughs> yeah, I bet that I bet that uh, bank teller is looking for you to adopt he or she right at that point when she saw that check. <laughs> well, yeah, call, call the manager at her. <laughs> I'll, have, I'll have you keep going here just for a minute because you just talked about when you when you actually sold it and you got the certain number. What are some of the other factors that you consider in the decision to sell or not sell? Like if I'm an if I'm sitting out there, you gave you gave the, you gave the viewers a great concept there of put a number in your head. Now, obviously a lot of times that number is much higher than what the value of the company is, which is fine. But so take into consideration, what are some of the other factors? Well, certainly I think the other factors is, you know, um, what, what's that going to look like for the rest of the company? You know, um, cause those are factors, you know, you, you uh, who's going to come in and buy this, who wants to buy it, what are their intentions with it? You know, you look at the, yeah. Timing of the marketplace, I think, you know, because when we sold, things were really starting to pivot again. And, 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 you know, do you have it in you to completely re-engineer your company again? You know, and and those types of things. And and then there's certain things about uncertainty, you know. Um, For those of us that have been around since, you know, 911 in the dot-com bust or the 2008 recession, you know, when you take the big hit. And it takes you several years to, to, to pull yourself out of that hole. Sometimes you feel like. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to take this a very attractive offer because it's, rec- you know, it, it, it represents 10 years of my own personal, you know, payback. And so, you know, getting that all in one year is enticing. So those are, I think, you know, it, it, it's not just personal wealth, but it's also, you know, what's the company going to look like? Because um, oftentimes you're going to be part of that for a short while, you know, as you make the transition. And um, and so those are, those are big factors, you know, uh, in terms of, what's your role going to be, um, how, how how are you going to continue to, to be a part of this that they want you to be a part of, you know, your uh, employment agreements, those types of things. Uh, there's things around the, the acquisition around some people want to do big earnouts or notes and things, and so those represent some risks. Um, same event. And some, just, some of the guys just want to ride off into the sunset and play golf every day, which is that's true. Which is fun for about a month. You know that you know, it, Tommy. In particular, if you, if you think about it, what you're talking about, it doesn't even have to be the IT industry. You know, it's any small business that you start because, you know, I refer to it as you know, I watched you know, I watched my father growing up and rolling up his sleeves, and he had a tire business. He was putting tires on himself before he got more employees. And to your point, that blood, sweat, and tears is hard to give up, and it makes it very personal. Particularly, I'm, I'm I'm assuming it's the same with you is. I'm guessing in the beginning, it wasn't like you had a staff of 400 people and you just said, okay, you do this, you do that. It's you. No, it's, it's very similar. You know, uh, fortunately, I, I acquired a small company and then kind of grew into it. I, I'm i not a son of an SMB, unfortunately. I kind of got indoctrinated into it. Um, but uh, I agree with the, some of the things that Tommy just said. Uh, you know, to me, when you're selling a company, the first and foremost thing is this cultural fit of the acquiring organization, whether it's a private equity group or whether it's another company or whether it's an individual, it's very important to make sure that the cultural fit is similar or synergistic to what you had in the company before. Because at the end of the day, you know, T- Tommy said it very well, it's, it's the people that you leave behind that helped you have this or not, helped you grow. Um, it's important to leave them in the right hands and, you know, deals can be, you know, all cash deals or it could be you might have an earn out. So you have a vested interest to make sure that the company functions and, you know, the people kind of stay on, the management team stays on. So having that understanding that culture and the synergy and the impact of that culture 
um, is is very critical. And uh, you know, as Peter Drucker used to say, you know, culture eats uh, strategy for breakfast. You know, so that's so that's uh, very important. Uh, and the second thing I would say, Tommy just mentioned is, you know, what's the idea? Are they going to pivot? Do they have the uh, the, the vision for the future as things are pivoting you know, in the technology business and in any business, you know, I, I say every five years, there is some kind of a change uh, that happens to be faster in, in the technology business. But is the new acquirer, do they know where the, where their vision is and is the vision sound? Well, one other thing, if you if you hear any background, I have a small to mid-sized business out mowing my grass right now and the perfect timing for them to show up. So, you know, I'm sure he's going to stick with this business for a while. Um, but, you know, the, the thing is, you know, I, I, I sat there and I talked about the emotional side of it and the fact that you, your blood, sweat, tears. How hard does that make? Now, let's focus on the IT industry on this one, Tommy. Not not, you know, not a different business, but whether it be MSP or whatever. You know, how do you determine the value or the asking price of your company? Did you guys go out and seek outside help? Or did you say, sit down at the table and spin a and say that's the number I want, or how did you how did you come up with what the value was? Well, you know, the, I think the valuations out there are somewhat scienced out to some degree in terms of IT services, MSP, what portion of your revenue stream represents product versus project services versus recurring revenue, and so all those have different multiple points, and so you know. Um, what I did, and I think what many other, like me do, is you attend these uh, educational webinars, seminars put on by different people like Paul Dipple and such like that. Um, I had an M&A consultant who was very, very expert in all this. And so uh, I think that's one thing to engage in because then you would certainly get you know, a very good perspective on the valuation of your company given its condition. And, and one of the key things a lot of business owners don't understand, especially in the IT industry, is their balance sheet. And, you know, how does that impact the valuation of your company? We, we get wrapped around the actual talking a lot of times about, you know, multiples of EBITDA. But the multiple EBITDA is just a top line number. It doesn't, you know, represent how are things going to balance out at the 11th hour. And that's where a lot of these deals kind of go sideways is, you know, things that get, you know, dangling out there on the balance sheet that the owner doesn't even realize it's out there. And they, they come to that realization at the level of hour that knocks down their, their asking price. So those are those are some of the key things to understand in terms, of, I think, the valuation, the proper valuation of your company. And, and that's that's using, you know, what I think are generally accepted industry, you know, standards in some way. I think that some of that is standard out. But then you have the owner's own perception, like you mentioned earlier, about, well, I think it's really worth more. And, every, you know, you're always going to have that. Um, yeah. And 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 uh, but but, you, but at that point, then you have to justify why it's more than what the industry calculations would come up with as well. Predict, you agree with that, or did you have a different philosophy? Yeah, I mean, it's it's it's, it's very similar. Um, my philosophy is, and that's what well, I would advise. I, I hate to interrupt, but you actually have two situations because you bought one, sold one, and we both did. You both bought and sold, so it's probably not yeah, as yeah. emotive. It's we, probably more on both sides. Yeah. Yeah, I've been on both sides of the table and that makes it interesting. Um, but I, I agree with Tommy. Uh, my view is that what I would advise to every business owner is it's a two-year horizon. The, the your your target date of sale is let's say you know a certain date. Two years before that is when you should go through a valuation process to really understand where you are and what changes you might need to make. What is the gap between your target number, as, as Tommy says, you know, what's your target number that'll make you comfortable and where you are today and plan the next two years to really build up that value. In the IT business, there are really three main drivers of equity value, particularly in the MSP business. That's the only experience I have. But um, in the MSP business, there are only three main drivers of equity value. Number one is what people call trailing 12 months EBITDA. So TTM EBITDA. That's very important. That's the number one marker. Number two is percentage of revenue that's recurring. I mean, right now we're looking at businesses that are 65, 70% recurring, particularly with you know, Office 365 and Microsoft Azure reselling cloud. All of that is lumped into what's called recurring revenue. And the third is top line growth. You know, are you growing higher than the industry average? 12 to 13% is the industry average CAGR. Um, are you growing higher than that? 
Um, those are the top three determinants of value. Completely agree with Tom, uh, with, with Tommy about you know making sure your balance sheet is strong. You don't have any you know debts that are that are outlying. At the end of the day, that's going to change the number that that you eventually get. Pratik, I just out of uh, and maybe you can follow up on this question. When you talk about the rearing recurring revenue, I mean, let's go back in the old days. You bought a company because they sold a lot of hardware. Pretty easy to see. You go to the recurring revenue. It's like uh, I'll use the example of my my pool guy I've had for 16 years. Just sold his business. That's recurring revenue. But he tells me he gets a thousand dollars for every house when he sells it. So how do you how do you how, how do you tell a buyer about the reoccurring revenue because he looks down the road and he goes, well, that looks good now, but they might like him. And when they leave, he may just cancel. You know, how do you deal with that? I think that's, that's a brilliant question. You know, recurring revenue without uh, looking at client retention rates has no value. So when you look at recurring revenue, you have to look at your client retention rate. Is your client retention rate higher than the industry average or at least the industry average? So you kind of have to t- take a look at both of those um, together. And then, you know, as you kind of start digging deeper, you start trying to understand what's your customer satisfaction score? What's the propensity you're going to lose these accounts? Taking a look at the contracts to see what hooks do you have and what are the exit uh, strategies or, or, or if a client tries to leave, what are those exit parameters and how strong is the contract? But, you know, that's a great question. Recurring revenue is is king because that kind of gives you the 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 comfort of ongoing revenue, and uh, yep. you know those are some of the things you have to look at. Well, I can tell you in the pool business, he asked me if you're going to drop this guy, you don't like him, can you keep him for at least three months, or I don't get my money. <laughs> so, so uh, Tommy, you know we talked about we talked about things uh, about what to look for in a prospective buyer. I would think you're a current associates was that being a big thing you know if i look at what just happened i believe it was the minnesota timberwolves where a rod and his billionaire friend are buying buying the uh, timberwolves but their commitment was in the contract it had to stay in minnesota it had to stay in minneapolis you know there are certain amount of people that keep do you you take that into consideration on you look at a buyer you you know is this guy going to keep my associates so what, what's he going to do what are some of the things you look at well, I think those are certainly desirable um, requests during the acquisition because as we talked about, you know, your employees, you want to see that they're taken care of, they're protected, that they get, you know, in our case, we had employee stock options. So during the, um, you know, transaction, you know, a lot of our key employees were, were coming along for a ride and getting a piece of the action, which was which was nice. So that that's helpful. But, you know, once the new owner comes in, and and takes control regardless of whatever you know you really don't have any control over that you know right we've seen that we see that time and time again when especially in the larger you know national companies will buy maybe a smaller uh, msp in a regional market and leave it alone for about a year or so and then you start seeing the the transition in the culture the people leaving and such like that. It happened in my own company. I mean, it, it, like I said, I think it's, it's, it's just kind of predictable even. So, um, you know, and I think it, it, change is just inevitable that comes along with every acquisition. And that some of the change could be good, some of the change could be bad, but the thing is change and people are going to come and go mostly a lot of times. There's going to be a lot, um, I, I think, transition of people because culture changes and when that culture changes, that's when you, I think you have, you know, uh, employees coming and going again. I, I would think that too, particularly you kind of look at sort of the same type of thing when you were looking at it, you know, I, I, here's, let's, let's go off script just a little bit here, even though there's no script. Um, that, what's the difference between what you look for when you're buying for some of these folks watching that way you think about buying a place and then selling you. I'm going to, I'm going to put something back on you. Is it, do you look at two different things? Besides when you buy, you're looking to get a deal. Yeah. I mean, to, to, to me, the number one important concept when you're buying a business is can this business run without you taking on the reins from day one? Is there a veteran management team that can keep the business going? 
Because if you jump into running a business, the whole concept of you know working in the business versus on the business, if you jump into working in the business from day one, you're not going to make the strategic advances you want to make. So the, the number one important thing when you're buying a business, you know, other than the financial considerations, you know, trying to get a good deal, looking at all the EBITDA multiples, you know, you know, looking at what's really recurring and what's not. So once you get all of those financial, uh, you know, discussions and the due diligence process out of the way, the number one thing to look at is can this business sustain without you jumping in and taking the reins? So, so that's something I look for when I buy a business. Well, we really have time for one more question. This is pretty important because uh, I'm sitting here watching and I'm thinking about either buying or selling my company. Let's help these folks out. What's one thing you didn't do or wish you had in the past? Tommy, we'll go with you first because I'm sitting here. What should I be on the lookout for that I better know? Well, you know, I think when I went through it, I I, I had all my ducks in a row because we've been and I, and I had an M&A consultant. And, and I think that's probably the, the one key word of advice I would give is find yourself a really good, strong M&A consultant that knows the industry. Uh, it's not good enough just to have your local attorney do these things because there's so many nuances about it. And my M&A attorney was, was so good. He was stronger than the attorneys. And, and so I was able to have everything buttoned up, including my employment agreement post acquisition and stuff that was really solid, that really protected me, you know, actually that I had to um, uh, enforce. And so, you know, those are the things that I would tell you, you know, it's uh, everything. And, 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 and also consider this, you know, everything starts off uh, looking like a great marriage, but, you know, be prepared for a better divorce. Uh, you know, that's what the agreement's about. That's why you need an M&A attorney and why you need their M&A consultant and a good attorney and a good tax advisor, too, because, uh, you know, you got to understand, the, you know, how this uh, income is being proportioned to you in the form of taxable income. And, mm -hmm. and that's a gotcha for a lot of companies. And we you know, had a company of companies that we acquired that weren't aware of that, didn't get the right advice and end up having this huge tax bill they weren't expecting. So things like that, that I think it are very important to consider. And fortunately, I had good enough counseling and advice along the way to where um, everything really uh, had, I, I didn't really have any surprises. I, I knew what I was dealing with. So anyway, that was. I was saying, all I know, Tommy, is I'm working from home just like everybody else. And I just hope my wife didn't over here. Why did somebody ask you how to prepare for divorce? <laughs> Yeah, that would. Tommy, you're Yeah, you probably will be <laughs> here on a Friday night date. <laughs> yeah. What's something you just really wish you would have known, and that something if I'm if I'm going to be doing this, what should I look for that I just didn't expect? You know, one thing that I regret that I should have done more of is is automation and processes. I should have done more. I should have. It's very hard to see the return on investment, but believe me, it's there. Um, and I, I wish I had automated some of our, you know, accounting processes, some of our quoting processes before I sold, uh, because a lot of those things were very dependent on me. So, you know, I wasn't able to make it that self-sustaining. So that's my one regret is I should have automated more stuff. No. Hey guys, I can't thank you enough. I hope the folks out there are listening. Now, before, by the way, let's make sure sign up for the CompTIA YouTube channel. Um, it's not just this show that CompTIA is doing. There's a lot of great information out there and a lot of learning opportunities. And so who knows, maybe I can get you guys a gig to tell people how to buy and sell. And, you know, next, you know, you'll be winning an Academy Award. But, you know, I really appreciate you two coming on. I hope people got a good feel for this um, because it's a tough decision. You know, I know somebody, you know, I've been in business 30 years. I've seen, Tommy knows, I've seen business. So I remember when Tommy sold his business. And I was really disappointed because I, well, what am I going to do? What, what am I going to do now without him? And so you, you look at that and we look back on that. And we just hope that people make the right decisions and take that personal side out of it. But Pratik, Tommy, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And from this son of an SMB, thank you again. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thanks, Bob.